Hello everyone and welcome to our sixth web seminar for the series of the Latin American webinars on physics. My name is Nicolas Bernal from the new ICTP SAFER, South American Institute for Fundamental Research in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and I will be your host today. We have a special webinar today because we have two speakers. On the one hand, we have Andrea Albert from the SLAC working uh, SLAC National Acceleratory Laboratory. She did her PhD in the Ohio State University, and now she's a postdoc, has a postdoc position at the SLAC, working on the Fermi Large Area Telescope. On the second hand, we have Miguel Angel Sanchez Conde from the Oscar Klein Center. He did his PhD in the Instituto Astrofisica Andalusia in Spain. And after a couple of postdocs in the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias, and the Stanford University, he moved to Stockholm, and he's now a fellow at the Oscar Klein Center. Andrea Miguel will talk today about search for gamma rays from dwarf galaxy with the Fermi Large Area Telescope. And we are glad to have them as our speakers today. To remind you that we can be part of the discussion, writing questions and comments using the Q&A system, the Google Plus Q&A system, and on Twitter with the hashtag LAWOP. Now we're, I will hand you over with Miguel and then Andrea. So thank you, thank you, Nicolas. So I guess that it's time to share my screen, right? Right. Please go ahead. Okay. So is everything okay? Out there? Looks Excellent. Good. Sure. Okay. Great. Uh, okay. Thank you for uh, for this invitation, guys. Of course, uh, we are very happy to to be here, both Andrea and myself, uh, on behalf of the of the lab collaboration. Uh, by the way, so today we would like to to summarize what's the what's the current status of the of our search for gamma rays uh, from dwarf spheroidal galaxies uh, satellites of the Milky Way uh, with the with Fermi lab data. So I will start first uh, introducing you to, to this, uh, you know, to this, to the field. Uh, essentially, giving a, a broad overview and uh, you know, to put everything into context. And then Andrea will follow uh, in the second half of the talk, uh, uh, essentially summarizing our, our uh, lab search and the kind of analysis that we that we perform on these objects. Okay, so you can go to slide two. Uh, of course, it's not my intention to to uh, to go so much into the details of this. Uh, you all know that uh, today we have uh, overwhelming evidence uh, to believe that most of the universe is actually most of the matter in the universe is actually composed by a non-baryonic form, exotic form of, of dark matter. So these evidences have been reported actually at different scales, and that's the the, the essentially the main message that I want to to make here. You can see, you know, I just. Uh, um, you know, give a few examples at different scales, from galactic scales to galaxy cluster scales, cosmological scales. So, as I said, we have a, a overwhelming evidence, observational evidence, to believe on this kind of dark matter. Uh, so, go to slide number two. This is again uh, a reminder about the the beautiful cosmological framework that we have at the moment that we call Lambda CDM, that in principle, you know, give give us a, a um, you know, a good explanation for all, all this uh, observational evidence I was talking about. Uh, just a brief reminder about this. Uh, the main the main thing is that it's settling the big, this big bang scenario, of course. Then we need this non-baryonic form of dark matter, uh, uh, mainly to explain you know all these kind of uh, the observations that we have at different scales in a consistent way. Then it must be cold, uh, and this is mainly due to the fact that we need these dark matter uh, particles to move at uh, non-relativistic velocities in order to explain the kind of large scale structure that we observed uh, in the current in, the, in you know in today's universe and also to to understand the how uh, how the the, the objects uh, form and evolve or at least the kind of picture that we have uh, from from observations and then of course you have this lambda term this enigmatic uh, dark energy in order to explain the the measure of cosmic acceleration as I said, you know, the, the framework is, is not perfect, but it's the best tool that we have at the moment in order to explain all these uh, observations at different scales. So you can go to slide number three. Actually, I'm doing it, so no, no, no need to, uh, to do it. Um, yeah, so despite all these observational evidence at, at different scales, we actually don't know what's the true nature of the, of the dark matter particle itself. 
Um, and unfortunately, there's not a good candidate in the standard model of particle physics. And actually, the neutrino, the only one that, that we know uh, uh, it exists, is actually excluded just because it cannot account for the total uh, matter uh, content that we measure. Uh, and of course, if you go beyond the standard model of particle physics, a huge plethora of, of you know, possible candidates arise. Uh, this plot is just a, a, an example of this. Uh, essentially, you know, it doesn't really matter the kind of parameter space that we have, but in the x-axis you have the mass of the matter particle. In the in the y-axis you have something which has to do with the with the kind of interactions that you expect uh, from these particles, and then you see that essentially, you know, you can have a, a, a lot of possibilities and that uh, spread over orders of magnitude. Actually, they can be different by orders of magnitude. Um, but we still, at least we know, you know, some of the requirements that this that matter particles should fulfill from the cosmological and astrophysical point of view, uh, mainly. They must be neutral, otherwise, of course, we, we should have detected them already. Uh, they have to be stable, or at least long-lived enough to be present today, since the early universe, right? Uh, they must be cold. Again, this is mainly due, uh, because we need them, uh, these cold dark matter particles, in order to explain the large scale structure. And, and of course, you must reproduce the measure the matter amount that we that we that we are measuring. Um, and I, I highlight this this fourth point just because I, as as you will see later on, uh, and Andrea actually will be reporting about our limits, right? And we are starting to 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 touch the relevant part of the parameter space uh, where you know where we are actually proving testing this this fourth point uh, for the first time. Uh, okay, so. Next slide, just trying to focus a bit uh, all these discussions. Uh, of course, there are different ways, different approaches to, to, to try to detect this matter particle, or at least to know more about the, the, the nature of this matter particle. I will be focusing, we will be focusing here on the indirect detection technique, and in particular, we will be talking about gammas. You, of course, you know that there can be also uh, other annihilation products, like neutrinos, positrons, and so on. But again, we will be talking about gammas here, uh, just because we want to to, um, to report on the on the Fermilab uh, results, right? Um, yep, yeah, and there are good reasons to believe, you know, to to, to focus on gammas. Um, I don't want to go really into the details of this, but essentially you have a, a good um, knowledge on the intrinsic spectrum, uh, just because uh, in principle you don't, uh, these gamma rays do not suffer from attenuation. Uh, this is true at least in the local universe. Then also, of course, you have gammas just because the, in the preferred dark matter particle physics models, uh, the, the mass of this dark matter particle uh, is typically in the GB to TB energy range. So essentially, I mean, this gives you in a natural way gammas, of course. And, and this is also a, good, uh, a very good thing, which is the fact that the gamma rays and, um, uh, do, I mean, just travel following straight lines. So you can you can track back these gamma rays and, and know the, the the emitting source. This is something that you cannot do, for instance, with um, uh, with positrons or charged particles, right? Um, okay. So now talking about the kind of gamma ray flux that you may expect in your in your telescopes uh, above a particular energy threshold, essentially is essentially given by the product of two terms. Uh, on one hand, you have uh, what we call the J factor term, which encloses all the astrophysical considerations. Essentially, you know, information about the how the matter it is distributed in the object, for instance, um, and you know, if you have some kind of surface structure there, and so on. So all the astrophysics is enclosed by by this guy, and then the second the second uh, ingredient here, the second uh, term is the particle physics term, which essentially glutinates all the particle physics consideration, like the the the, the mass of the matter particle itself. The cross section of the interaction, the the channel uh, where you expect these annihilations to to occur, and so on. Uh, so of course, if you take a look at the J factor, uh, since you have annihilations of the matter particles, uh, this guy is proportional to the square of the dark matter density along the line of sight. So you have to integrate all the dark matter density distribution uh, to the square, right? And and this gives you a, a good hint about where to search. So essentially, you you want to point your telescope uh, or you know, just to analyze data from those places in the universe where you expect the, the largest concentrations of dark matter, like the galaxy center, dwarf galaxies, nearby dwarf galaxies, local galaxy clusters, and so on, right? Because also we are dealing with fluxes, so we need the sources to be close. Okay, then, uh, of course, there are different dark matter search strategies that one can envision. So each of these has, you know, it, it, I would say its own pros and cons. 
Um, so again, I don't want to spend too much time on this, uh, but in principle, you know, uh, uh, you can you can take different targets into account, like the galactic center, which should be in principle the, the brightest objects uh, object in the in the gamma ray sky for uh, for dark matter annihilations. You can have different different things here, like as I said, galaxy clusters. You can also uh, look for spectral lines and so on. But in this talk, we are going to uh, to talk about uh, these dark matter satellites. Uh, essentially, you can have um, well, you expect in Lambda CDM, you expect a, a good number of, of satellites orbiting the Milky Way. Some of them will be will be hosting uh, gas and stars, and therefore we can see them uh, in other wavelengths, right? Like in optical and so on. In some other cases, we have to expect them to be completely dark. Why not? And maybe the only way to, to detect them will be in gamma rays due to annihilations. But in any case, this is something that we are not going to touch here today. So we are only going to focus on the on the and dwarf galaxies that we know uh, exist and, and, as I said, host gas and stars. Okay, then talking about more a bit more about these dwarf galaxies, and they are they are to be very good targets for for uh, in the detection. Uh, they are the most dark matter dominated systems that we know in the universe. So the the mass to light ratio that we infer from from the movement of stars is is particularly high, a few hundreds typically. For the for the most recent discovered uh, objects, uh, which is great, and uh, we know right now we know I would say like two dozens of them more or less, uh, and we are starting to know more. I will talk a bit more about this in a second. Then uh, you are you are interested in, in annihilation fluxes, so it also means that you need objects which are close to us, and and they are they are also you know we know dwarf galaxies which are actually quite close from us, like a few uh, dozens of uh, kiloparsecs. That's very good too. And um, probably more importantly uh, than all this is that they are expected to be uh, free from any other astrophysical uh, gamma ray source. Yeah. So essentially, this means that if you if you um, um, detect some gamma ray emission coming from one of these objects, uh, you know uh, you can start really start thinking about exotic physics like gamma radiation because in principle you don't expect these uh, these uh, these objects to 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 host. Uh, gamma ray emitters, astrophysical gamma ray emitters. That's what I mean. Um, and finally, just uh, let me let me tell you that from the observational point of view, they are they have been typically detected as a dim stellar uh, uh, overdensity. I would say in, the, in 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 a particular region of the sky, using typically optical surveys. And this is the case, for instance, of the uh, the four, uh, 14 ultra faint dwarfs that were discovered in the last decade using slow and digital sky survey data. Okay, this is just uh, for completion. I would like to to, um, to to show you where these these guys are typically located. So this is in galactic coordinates. For those of you that are not familiarized, this means essentially that you have the galactic center in the center of this map, right? Then you have the galactic plane uh, along this, uh, you know, just on the horizontal line crossing the galactic center, and then the galactic poles uh, essentially at 90 degrees, plus minus 90 degrees in this in this map. So you can see immediately that uh, many of them actually lie at high latitudes, uh, and this is also very good because, uh, in principle, you, you don't expect too much contamination from the from the galactic plane. You know, from many different astrophysical processes that can give you gamma rays in the galactic plane region. That's also very good. Uh, the color, different colors, just mean um, well, red one uh, correspond to the old uh, you, the old dwarfs, let's say before 2006. And then the, the blue ones correspond to the to the new objects detected by Sloan uh, using Sloan data from 2006 to to 2%. Okay, uh, so just a, a, a brief note about how to measure the, the matter contained in the, in the dwarfs. What, what uh, you need, you, what you really need, is to determine uh, the stellar velocity dispersion using using a spectroscopy. So this, in classical dwarfs, means that you 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 typically have like hundreds of stars uh, that will have uh, uh, you know good uh, spectroscopic uh, measurements. That's very good because essentially you know you, you can infer the underlying the matter distribution in a in a quite precise and accurate way. But in the case of the ultra faint dwarf galaxies recently discovered by Sloan or by other means, uh, you know with other other surveys, uh, we'll talk a bit more about this in a second. So in this case, you only have typically few tens of stars, and that gives you essentially, uh, you know, you you have a, a big uncertainty in the uh, in the dark matter distribution or, or the best dark matter density profile, uh, the parameters of the dark matter density profile. 
that feeds the data. So this is something that you can see, just as an, as an example, something that you can see in the plot on the right uh, for the old classical dwarfs. Uh, so the stellar spheroid, I, I, I put it the stellar spheroid in, with an arrow there. So this is what you what you actually expect from from um, just from from the visible mark, let's say. But then what you see, what you infer is actually a, a dispersion profile which remains generally uh, flat up to large radii. So every every dot here, by the way, every, every uh, data point here correspond to, typically to a few tens of of, uh, of stars. Okay, so in this case, as I said. For these guys, you have plenty of information if you compare to, you know, to the ultra-faint dwarfs. So in the case of the J-factor, I mean, we are interested in the J-factor, right, the, the, which gives you a, a measure of the, you know, how bright are the, are the sources uh, in terms of that annihilation. So essentially, you have to, uh, to, uh, to take this velocity dispersion profile and then assume a particular that density profile. Uh, for the underlying damage distribution, and then you, you come up with an estimate of the J-factor, which, again, will be much more accurate in the case of the old dwarfs uh, and less accurate, uh, substantially less accurate for the ultra faint dwarfs. So these are the, the J-factors for the, for the non-dwarf galaxies. Um, so you can see essentially, again, the y-axis corresponds, it's like a measure, measure of, the, of how good is this, uh, this particular target for for you know for our search right um, and then uh, something that you that you can that you realize that is that of course since we are dealing with fluxes this this typically goes as the square you know goes as the, the inverse of the of the distance uh, square right uh, so that's the main trend that you can see uh, and given the robust that's not it's not much that you can do uh, apart from that but Andrea will will talk a bit more about this in a second um, okay, so I was talking about just a two, uh, like two dozens of these dwarf galaxies uh, at, at present, but actually, you know, if you go to Lambda CDM, you expect a lot, a lot more of these kind of uh, objects orbiting the Milky Way. So some, some studies like the one by, that uh, Elip Tolerud did uh, uh, with James Bullock and others a few years ago, so they seem to point to something like 500 of, of these guys inside the billion radius of our galaxy. Uh, some of them, of course, will be maybe you know not uh, visible at all, or maybe they are too far to be detected by you know by our surveys and so on. But still, you may expect uh, many of them, much more than two dozens, to be to be detected in, in the in the near future. And I would like to remind you that that we don't have a complete uh, coverage of the whole sky with any of the surveys that we have at present, and this explains actually why we only have two dozens. Uh, just essentially because we didn't cover the whole, the whole, the whole sky. We, I mean, we don't have data from uh, from the whole sky, right? Not yet. Uh, and this is something. Uh, this lets me to the to the next thing. Essentially, uh, as I said, uh, people discovered 14 ultra faint dwarfs using Sloan data. So here in the on the top, you can see a, a map of uh, the the portion of the sky that was mapped by by Sloan, right? Uh, as you can see in the gray, in gray area, the gray area corresponds to the to the to the regions that were not mapped. As you can see, there's still a, a huge uh, you know portion of the sky that were not uh, was not mapped by by Sloan. And then uh, you know the, the idea here is that if you map these these new these uh, you know uncovered areas with enough uh, you know sensitivity, you may expect some of uh, some new uh, ultra faint dwarfs to to be to be detected, right? And this is something that the that people recently did using uh, the dark energy survey. Uh, so you can see uh, at the bottom, you can see the, the coverage of this of this particular survey. Essentially, they will cover 5,000 square degrees of the southern hemisphere in five years. Uh, and according to these estimates from some people, you may expect something as a discovery of between five to 20 new dwarfs, uh, more or less. Uh, so they 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 did the first release just a couple of months ago. Um, so it's called the DSY1A1, and it's essentially 1,800 square degrees that you can see in this map here. And the cool thing is that they actually detected uh, a, a bunch of new uh, candidates uh, for dwarf as far as the galaxies. Uh, so you can see actually where these galaxies are located. I put in the title eight or nine just because there, there's a, a work uh, uh, that was. In, Submitted in parallel to the DS collaboration official work, where uh, the authors were actually, uh, you know, reporting on the discovery of nine satellites, 
while the DST collaboration only reported officially on eight. Uh, but this is, uh, again, this is uh, a field which is evolving very rapidly, and, and you may expect a lot of more uh, of these candidates, of this kind of objects, uh, uh, and, you know, to, to appear, to show up in the, in the, in the next year. OK, so um, these are, this is just a table showing the kind of uh, characteristics that these uh, candidates for drug analysis has. Uh, so each system is, in principle, identified just as a, a statistically significant overdensity of stars. Um, and then what you typically do is to perform the, the so-called HR uh, diagram that you can see on the bottom right. Uh, so it's essentially a, 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 you, you, you plot the, the color versus the magnitude in, in some particular uh, uh, bands. And then you, you infer from that the, the stars that have a common origin, and typically, they, they, I mean, in this case, in the case of torque analysis, they, they, they exhibit very, very low metallicities, uh, which correspond to a very old stellar population with a common origin, as I said. Um, OK. And then there's still one more discovery that was reported also very recently by a PANSTARS collaboration uh, in Triangulum. Um, in this case, we are talking about an, an object which is also uh, very close. It's something like 30 kiloparsecs. This is this kind of distances you can infer from the from the this color magnitude diagrams I was talking about. And in principle, the properties of this guy should be also quite similar to the ones of Willman, Sege, uh, Sege 2, Botes, essentially the, the ultra faint dwarf discovered by by Sloan. And then, uh, okay, as I said, um, Andrea will be now reporting on analysis that, that the Fermilab collaboration did on these objects. So I stop here, okay? Okay, does everything look okay? Sure. Cool. So let's keep this train moving. Uh, so like uh, Miguel said, if we see a gamma ray signal from these dwarf galaxies, that's uh, considered a smoking gun for exotic physics like dark matter because there's really no standard astrophysical processes happening in these dwarf galaxies uh, that are expected to give gamma rays. And so we can look for gamma rays with the Fermi Large Area Telescope. Uh, this has been this is uh, on board the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, which has been in orbit for over six years now. And uh, this has been a beautiful instrument that has just uh, you know opened a new window on the gamma ray sky, and we've learned so much. Uh, and it's also it's a wonderful instrument for following up with these new uh, discovered dwarf candidates because the Fermi is a survey instrument, so it has already been observing these objects, but we just didn't know where to look in the data before. And so Fermi will see the entire sky every three hours when it's in standard survey mode. And so the fermi lac collaboration is a team of about 400 uh, international scientific members, and all of our data is public. And so we do have a new data release. Uh, that will be made public very soon called PASS-8. Currently the public data is uh, using the uh, reconstruction and event classification scheme we call PASS-7, reprocessed. And I just want to motivate here uh, the improvements with PASS-8 because this is the data set that the LAT and the DES teams used in our analysis that I'll be discussing later. And I think the bottom line for dwarf search is that in PASS-8, our point source sensitivity improved by about 40% in the relevant energy ranges. And this comes from improving both the point spread function and also the acceptance or the effective area. And like I said, that will be made public very soon. And so we have performed a search on those uh, previously known before, you know, pre-DES dwarfs that Miguel mentioned. Uh, and this paper has also come out on the same day uh, as the paper we did with the DES collaboration. And so the results shown on this slide here are from the pre-DES dwarfs that have pretty well measured J factors. 
And the bottom line here is we, we searched, we did a joint analysis using 15 dwarfs. We did not see any significant gamma ray emission. And therefore, by doing a joint likelihood, we're able to take the combined power of a null detection in all 15 of these objects to derive very, very robust and also constraining limits. And that's what's shown on the bottom. And so you can see our solid black line is our current limits from the most recent Pass 8 analysis using these uh, known dwarfs. And the dashed horizontal line that slightly increases at lower dark matter masses is that thermal rel cross-section that Miguel mentioned at the beginning. And so I remind you that if you just assume a weak scale particle annihilating with this cross-section, you get out the observed relic abundance of dark matter in the universe. And so I always remind everyone this is an incredibly well-motivated hypothesis for indirect dark matter searches. And we are testing this hypothesis, and Fermi was really the first experiment to hit the thermal relic uh, threshold with our sensitivity. And so you can see here that we, in this particular plot, we're excluding cross sections at or below, or yeah, at the thermal relic cross section for masses below 100 GeV, and we're starting to cut deeper in at lower masses as well. And so we haven't seen any dark matter, but we are starting to test very viable dark matter hypotheses with the combined dwarf analysis. And this is particularly interesting if you want to use it as an independent check of other dark matter claims. For example, there is an excess of gamma rays around a GEV in the galactic center that many people have interpreted to be from dark matter annihilation. And so the cool thing with the dwarfs is you would expect the same dark matter in the galactic center as you would expect in the dwarfs. So if you see a signal in the galactic center, then you would expect to also see a signal in the dwarfs. And mind you, the individual dwarfs are going to be fainter than the galactic center because their J factors are smaller. However, when you do the combined joint analysis, this gives you additional power. And so what's shown here is our current limits from the dwarf analysis. And then also shown on this plot are the contours from recent papers claiming a dark matter interpretation of the GEV access. And so what you can see is that our limits from the dwarfs are starting to uh, challenge some of these signal claims um, of the excess in the galactic center. And so the dwarfs are an incredibly independent or incredibly important independent check of a dark matter interpretation of the galactic center excess. And the sensitivity of the dwarfs is going to improve in the future and so they will be an important check to help make the situation in the galactic center more clear. So one of the ways that we are going to be able to improve the sensitivity of the dwarf analysis is by finding new dwarfs. And like I said, Fermi has already been observing the entire sky. And so when we find new dwarfs, we're going to be able to use the entire exposure of the Fermi lat over its over six year uh, mission so far. And so what we did is we had a agreement with the DES collaboration. So the lat and the DES collaborations collaborated and they told us where these new candidates were, and then we could follow up with the gamma ray analysis quite quickly. And I will point out that uh, I try to be very careful to call these objects that were found in the in DES candidates until we get uh, spectroscopic data telling us the stellar kinematics that we need to determine if these are in fact dark matter dominated and what their J factors are. Uh, until that time, these are simply candidates. And so we have Reticulum 2 has been confirmed as a dwarf uh, spheroidal galaxy, uh, but the other seven, I think at this point, are still candidates. Uh, anyway, so what's shown here are the counts maps uh, above a GEV from the eight candidates that we searched in the they're right smack in the middle. And what's sort of maybe obvious by eye, but then also what we found in a statistical analysis is that there's no significant gamma ray emission coming from any of these objects. We did see our largest positive deviation from our background model in Reticulum 2, which was the dwarf galaxy that was uh, confirmed to be a dwarf galaxy and is also rather close at about 32 kiloparsecs. The test statistic in our search was 6.7 and then the best fit point was for a mass of 25 GeV for dark matter annihilating into a pair of tau leptons. And so then since we scanned in mass and channel, you do need to apply a trials factor to convert that TS into a p-value or a significance. And so when you take into account the scan in mass and channel, that TS corresponds to 1.5 sigma. 
And then if you also take into account the fact that we looked in eight different dwarf candidates, that significance goes down to 0.26 sigma. And so clearly not a significant detection, which is why we set upper limits. Now, in order to set upper limits, we need a j-factor. And without spectroscopic data, we don't have a measured j-factor. Uh, however, what we did in this paper is we did a very simple first order estimate of what we could expect the j-factor to be given the distance. And so what we noticed, like Miguel said, is with these dwarfs that we've been using in previous line analyses, they seem to follow um, a 1 over d squared distribution. And so what we did is we took those dwarfs, we fit a line to it, and so then from this you can sort of get a, from the distance you can get an estimate of the j-factor, making the assumption that the candidate that you are talking about is one, a dwarf, and then two, uh, has similar properties to the dwarfs that we already know about. And so, like I said, this is a, lots and lots of caveats to this assumption. However, you need to make this assumption in order to interpret the flux limits from these objects in a dark matter context. And so, when you make that assumption, these are the limits that you could expect to get from these new candidates given our assumed J factors. And then also the dashed red line shows what you could get if you combined all of those uh, predicted limits. And you can see again that you get an increase in the power by combining these objects instead of looking at them individually. And uh, additionally, the, the closest objects like Reticulum 2 are the ones that are primarily driving these limits. And so on March 10th, which I dubbed Dwarf Day, <laughs> happy Dwarf Day, everyone, there was a, an additional paper by an uh, independent group that was also checking out these new dwarf candidates, and they reported an excess. And in Reticulum 2, which again, I remind you, is the dwarf where that's the closest, and therefore you expect to have the brightest uh, J factor from this set of candidates. And so the two plots that I, I have up here, um, the top one shows the significance as a function of mass in all of the dwarfs. So they took the dwarf candidates in DES and also the known dwarfs, and they did a whole search. And a point that I like to make here is that in this analysis, they were seeing negative 3 sigma uh, fits, which to me, uh, I guess I'm very conservative, the negative 3 sigma fit suggests that your sort of systematic uncertainty from your background modeling uncertainties is around the 3 sigma level. And so for me, the way I interpret this is I say, well, if you're getting negative 3 sigma fits, then I am less confident about a positive 3 sigma fit truly being a, a real signal. Uh, however, I realize that that statement is not universally uh, agreed upon. And so, anyway, they were using uh, PAST7 reprocessed data, because like I said, PAST8 is not public yet, and really the big difference between uh, their analysis and our analysis is that with PAST7 reprocessed, after taking into account a trials factor from scanning in mass, they had 2.3 sigma as their significance, and that is best compared to our significance of 1.5 sigma using PAST8. And so really the big difference here is PAS7 versus PAS8. I remind you that PAS8, we expected the point source sensitivity to improve. Well, actually, we know the point source sensitivity will improve by 40%. So really the bottom line here is that with a more sensitive data set, the significance has gone down from 2.3 sigma to 1.5 sigma. And so this is something to keep an eye on, but at this point I would say that it's not looking like there is a, uh, a very strong convincing signal coming from reticulum tip. And then there was an ad additional paper uh, by Dan Hooper and Tim Linden uh, that was also confirming that they see an excess in Reticulum 2 and using a different analysis, uh, they had a local significance of 3.2 sigma. And everyone seems to agree that the about the properties of this excess is happening for uh, a dark matter mass around 25 GeV uh, for an annihilation in Taos. All right, and so like I mentioned, we need spectroscopic data to confirm if these are in fact dwarfs, and we have this for Reticulum 2 now, so it is confirmed new dwarf discovered by DES, which I think is amazing. And then using the spectroscopic data, different groups have been able to actually measure the J factor uh, of this object, and so then you can say, well, depending, like Miguel was saying, depending on the dark matter profile assumptions that you make, uh, you can conclude that the J factor is somewhat different, and what's shown here 
uh, are the different J factors that are determined by other groups. But I will point out that within error bars, uh, these reported J factors are pretty are in line with our simple 1 over d squared estimation that we had for reticulum 2. So we weren't completely far off with that. And so then, well, what else is next? We, like uh, Miguel said, this was only looking in year one of the DES data. There is going to be year two available quite soon, and so hopefully we'll find even more. And then DES is an optical survey in the southern hemisphere, but we have an even more powerful one that will cover more sky coming up called LSST. And so we can really, I think we can be optimistic to find a lot more dwarfs with these southern hemisphere optical surveys. And what's shown on this plot here is the expect, expected limits for the Fermilat dwarf analysis using 10 years of exposure and 3 times 15, so 45 dwarfs. And you can see, and then also some signal contours from the uh, interpretation of the galactic center excess as dark matter. And so you can see that with more dwarfs and with the in extended exposure from the Fermilat, uh, we're really going to be able to cut deep below the thermal relic cross section and really start to test a lot of these models um, that people are claiming for the galactic center excess. So I think that's awesome. Uh, so just, it's been, we've released many dwarf analyses, but we're, there's still reason to be optimistic and, and, and expect them to just keep getting better. And they're uh, an amazing clear test um, of dark matter. Like I said, these are seeing dark matter or seeing gamma rays from these guys would be a smoking gun. They're in relatively clean regions of the sky. So this really is, is a really robust dark matter search that'll just keep getting better. And so that's the end. Uh, and I guess at this point we go on and take questions. And Miguel and I thank you for your attention. So thank you, both of you guys, for this interesting seminar. Now we should pass to the round of questions. So remember that you can ask questions to Andrea and Miguel via the Google Q&A system at the webinars page and via our Twitter with the hashtag LAWOP. So I don't know if there are questions. So we have a question here. I have many. Can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. OK, my first one is uh, how are these new dwarfs compare with the angular the resolution of Fermi in the sense that do you expect that at some point it's going to appear kind of miracle dwarf galaxy that Fermi can resolve in, in a better way than the previous dwarf that are already analyzed? I don't know who can ask who can answer the, if Andrea or Miguel Angel. Yeah, I can take that one. No problem. Yeah, so so you you okay. So you are asking essentially about how the the PSF of the instrument, right? The angular resolution of the instrument yeah. compares to the kind of annihilation the, the, the extension of the annihilation flux in the dwarf, right? Um so I would say um, you know, it's quite unlikely that we are going to resolve uh, this with, with Fermi because essentially, uh, um, you know, 90% uh, of the annihilation flux, for instance, for an NFW profile, uh, is coming from the region within the scale, the so-called scale radius, and the scale radius uh, sustains an angle in the sky of typically 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 more or less degrees, right? So essentially, you know, we just uh, everything. It's just within the PSF of the of the, of the instrument. Um, um, of course, with pass eight, we have a better angular resolution. Uh, but, but still, I would say, you know, like generally speaking, I would expect these ultra faint dwarfs and the new ones to come to be, you know, very small for for Fermi. And essentially, we will be integrating the the whole profile, the whole nation signal in these objects. But that's actually that's actually good. Uh, in my opinion, because essentially you are not sensitive, uh, you know, you are not so sensitive to the kind of animation, the kind of dark matter density profile that you assume for these objects. So it doesn't really matter if you have a core or a cast profile. Essentially, when you integrate the whole signal within the scale radius, it doesn't really matter. You will have you will have essentially the same total animation flux. Uh, so that's you know, in some sense, that's that's totally good. 
Okay, thank you. I have a, another one that is more or less related with the same stuff. It's kind of uh, how this dwarf history, I mean, the, how they were merging with the with the dark matter halo of the Milky Way may affect this kind of analysis in the sense of to compare what is happening in the galactic center with what could happen in the, in the dwarfs. Let's see how, if it is some caveats or some problem in which to compare both measurements in the same annihilation cross section versus mass of dark matter for WIMPs. Yes, I can say something about that. So there is a, a point to be made uh, to take into consideration when you compare the galactic center uh, with the dwarfs is that the the dark matter density profile distribution in the galactic center has much much larger uncertainties than in the dwarfs. so uh, you'll remember that the J factor goes as uh, the integral of density squared and so how cuspy things are in the galactic center if you get a larger increase towards the the center uh, versus a more cord uh, profile, then the cuspier profiles are going to give you a, a brighter predicted gamma ray signal. And so then when you interpret your, your flux limits or your flux signal uh, in terms of dark matter, you have to make some assumption about the cuspiness in the galactic center. And so we show the signal contours that have been published uh, when we compare them with our dwarf limits. However, there has been work that's been shown that those contours can move down and escape our limits uh, if you consider different levels of cuspiness in the galactic center. And the levels of cuspiness pretty much come mostly from n-body simulations, not from actual observations. Now, for the dwarfs, the J-factor is um, much more robustly determined since it's based on actual stellar kinematics from the dwarfs themselves. And so, the, the dwarf limits, I'd say, are, are rather robust, and the signal contours for the galactic center uh, excess interpreting as a dark matter uh, should probably be, be somewhat larger, taking into account uncertainties in the cuspiness in the galactic center. Okay, thank you. I, I have a question, actually, again, um, with respect to J factors. So, so the J factor is only uh, estimated using this stellar kinematics, but for these new dwarfs, you're just extrapolating the with the um, but using the, the other J factor for other known dwarfs, right? For most of them, with reticulum 2 at this point, we do actually have a measure J factor for reticulum 2. Yes, but once you can you, you measure the this stellar kinematic with the new dwarf, how much this could could be improved the, the J factor, the uncertainty of the J factor? Right, and that's actually still a lot of work that's being done, uh, and maybe Miguel can speak more to this, but uh, there, there is a lot because you. I think people will mostly agree um, about the dark matter content where you actually have the stars, but sort of extrapolating that out beyond the stars uh, requires an assumption on your dark matter profile, and that assumption can lead to different J factors uh, that come from the measurement. So there is some uncertainty on the J factors, um, even though they're uh, in the in the dwarfs as well. Yeah, this this. Uh, uh Actually, uh, some kind of the degeneracy between the isotropy of these uh, stellar, you know, velocity dispersions and and the kind of profile that you are so uh, assuming, uh, and it's, it's difficult to break us at this uh, kind of degeneracy. Um, but uh, but I will say, you know, I will say that of course, um, you know, we, we were quite conservative in our analysis. As Andrea was was mentioned, we want to assume a 0.4 uh, dex for that entity, uh, you know, in, in our J factor estimate, and this is perfectly in line, you know, with the kind of J factors and entities that we that we are measuring in known dwarfs. So in that in that regard, I think we we are, you know, we did a safe, you know, we took a safe <laughs> approach somehow. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So are there more questions? Yeah, I have another question also. Please go ahead. So one is, I mean, I guess also uh, Andrea, she showed some improvement in the sense if we want to, to kind of exclude a 1TV WIMP, how, how long we have to wait, I mean, or how many dwarf galaxies we have to, to I mean, has to be found in order to, to push the bound so, so much to higher energies. And a second question, just to take advantage of the time in the microphone, 
uh, how does his stand this same analysis for decaying dark matter instead of annihilating wings? Right. So, the to answer the question, like how long will it take us to probe a TeV uh, with Fermi? I, I think that probing a TeV mass with Fermi can will be quite challenging. Uh, you can see that even with our predictions with 10 years and 45 dwarfs, um, we're hitting a few hundred GeV. Uh, and so, barring uh, some very, very clever idea to dramatically increase the sensitivity of our, of our dark matter searches with Fermi, um, I think that our best shot of getting a, you know, testing the TeV uh, thermal relic cross-section will be future uh, gamma ray experiments like CTA, the Trenkov Telescope Array, which is going to, if you look at um, the Hess limits, which I think are somewhere in one of those plots, uh, CTA is going to improve the sensitivity by roughly a factor of 10, and you can see if you extrapolate the Hess limits to a factor of 10, we hit thermal relic around a TeV. Uh, and so, with CTA is going to come on board in the next few years, um, but then we'll have to make sure that the exposure in the galactic center in order to test uh, a dark matter hypothesis needs to be quite deep with CTA, and so depending on uh, how people prioritize the dark matter search there, um, I hope we won't have to work to wait too long. I'm actually quite excited for CTA in order to probe a TeV mass thermal relic myself. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, right, it's, and, and I can't really think of another way to do it um, in in the near yeah. future. Well, I, I, I can, CTA... maybe I would like to to I can add something to to that discussion. Um, so if we restrict ourselves to, to what you can do with dwarfs, then, I mean, I fully agree with Andrea, of course, and because that's the reality, right? But there, there are actually other dark matter proofs that you can use with Fermi to reach, you know, to be actually more competitive in the TV regime or sub-TV regime. Uh, so you are starting to be better somehow with other approaches compared to what you can do with dwarfs. And I'm referring basically to, the, to what you can do with cosmological dark matter annihilation. So in that case, you are using the isotropic gamma ray background measurement by the Fermilat. And so, so you essentially have uh, information and data uh, almost up to the TeV. So that actually allows you to put very stringent and very competitive limits using Fermilat data in the sub-TV and TV energy regime. Much better actually than the dwarfs. Um, yeah. But again, if we restrict ourselves to what you can do with dwarfs, only dwarfs, then yeah, I fully agree that the future then is CTA and ground-based telescopes. And I believe the second question was asking about the decay results. And so all of the annihilation results are based sort of intrinsically on a flux upper limit. And so using a J factor where you integrate over density as opposed to density squared, uh, then you can sort of use that to rescale um, and, and derive for a lifetime upper limit. Um, I guess for me, my personal experience with the lifetime of limits comes from the line analysis uh, that I've worked on, where, for example, lines I think are some of the best slash possibly only ways to test uh, something like a gravitino, where it decays to a gamma ray and a neutrino gives you a monochromatic chromatic signal. And so we do also produce limits on, on dark matter decay, although as far as I, as I know, the dark matter decay doesn't really have this sort of benchmark uh, level like the thermal relic cross-section in the annihilation case, which I think is why people focus on that. Yeah, in this case, Roberto, I mean, it's better to go for galaxy clusters, for instance, right? Because you have a linear dependence with the mass, uh, the dark matter mass, and then you, you prefer actually to go for most massive objects, essentially. So, yeah, even if it is a flux, it doesn't really matter. Galaxy cluster will be, you know, will be actually more competitive. That's my guess. Yeah, and I guess that because the, there's big uncertainties with annihilation and galaxy clusters from um, our substructure uncertainties, right? So we don't really know how much substructure there is, and if there's really, really dense, if there's lots of really dense uh, subhalos, then you expect to see a brighter dark matter signal, but those uncertainties are um, relaxed somewhat when you do the integral over density linear as opposed to density squared. That's uh, Yeah, so then that would also be really uh, good news for, for galaxy clusters as being a a more robust probe of dark matter decay. Okay. So I can see a comment coming from Tim Linden. So I don't know if you guys can see it. So he said that, just a quick comment, I'm not sure that a comparison between a 1.5 sigma excess in the Fermi pass IOT analysis and the 2.3 sigma excess in the Geringer Samlet et al. analysis is straightforward, since they are not assuming the spectral trials factor. 
That's right. So, right, the Grinja Simath um, 2.3 didn't take into account uh, the scan in channels. Um, but the if you look at the DNDE, uh, the expected gamma ray distribution for, say, a BB bar or a tau channel, they overlap quite a bit. And so, um, and I don't know the numbers exactly, but if you, folding in the, the channel component um, is really not going to give a big, big change in the significance uh, because of that overlap, right? We, you can't treat the, the different channels as independent. That would be way overestimating your trials factor. Um, and so I agree that they aren't directly comparable because also both of those significances uh, took a data-based uh, way to convert the TS into a p-value. So in a perfect world where the model perfectly describes, background model perfectly describes your, your data, then having one degree of freedom difference between you know looking for a signal or not looking for a signal, then your your significance is simply the square root of the TS. So then you take our 6.7 square root of that, you know that's two point something, and we're claiming 1.5. And this is something we this is a detail, but we something we discuss in, in the dwarf paper is that we can tell when we look in blank sky fields that our TS distribution from the blank sky fields based on the data is different than you would expect from like a 1 over chi-squared. And we think that this is due to things like unresolved sources uh, that are not being put into our background model. And so Grinders and all also use a data-driven um, approach to rescale the TS to a significance, uh, but they used the area more around reticulum to itself as opposed to uh, a large-scale random sky thing like we did. So anyway, like I say, that there are some details that make those two numbers not directly comparable, but I still think that roughly those are quite comparable. And we did um, look and rerun our analysis using PASS 7, reprocessed um, the data set that they used, and we came up with a similar significance to that 2.3 sigma um, using the, the PASS 7, and so then it goes down to 1.5 sigma and PASS 8. I think that's the, the bottom line. Okay, cheers. There's another comment, uh, again, by Tim. So he's saying, I think both are warranted depending on the question you're asking. If you ask what is the significance of a dark matter signal in the dwarf, you're, you take a trial factor hit. If you ask, do the dwarfs confirm or rule out the galactic, the galactic center, you don't. Right, I don't know if you want to comment something. Well, with the galactic center, I guess if you say, does it rule out the teeny tiny contour that was published or that was posted in the dial in at all paper, uh, our 95% confidence limits in the BB bar channel do rule out the contour presented in that work. However, I think what Tim might be alluding to is that the contour in that work can move up or down depending on what you assume about the local dark matter density or the cuspiness. Right. And so then I would say that there is an uncertainty that is that should be folded into that contour that isn't right now. And so I would I would like really very much like to see um, an updated work with the the signals in the, the the claim signals of the galactic center with the dark matter interpretation that folds in the uncertainty on the cuspiness in the contour itself, so that it'll be more easy for us to compare with the dwarf limits. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and there's a next comment say that he completely agrees. The numbers for both analyses are very comparable. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so I, are there more questions, comments? So, uh, so let's let me thank Andrea and Miguel again, and all of our viewers. Then we'll meet next week for another Latin America webinars on on physics. So, thank you all, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It's fun. It was fun. Thank you. Okay, see you. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.